Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest rendition of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Outer space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. Now, on to the science fiction. Stick, Rock, Hide Written by Hamster IV Humanity revives an ancient way of war. For every species, the technology of violence can be viewed as a waltz composed of three beats. Stick, rock, and hide. When the earliest primitive grasped a broken tree branch and swung it at his foe, Stick let out its first beat. When that injured foe stumbled upon a fist-sized pebble to throw back at his antagonist, Rock was introduced to the melody. Finally, Hyde completed the trio when the skin of a dead animal was stretched over a wooden frame and used to absorb the rock sting as Stick sought to close the distance on Rock. Every innovation in the art of war is just Stick, Rock, and Hyde continuing their waltz. Stick, Rock, Hyde. Axe, sling, shield, stick, rock, hide, pike, bow, mail. On and on it will go the ages until each species' inevitable discovery of high energy chemistry, at which point stick would be forced to drop out and hide would take a limited role. This pattern holds true for every species but two. The most well-known were the humans. Even when rock had been all but perfected, humans insisted on fixing a utility knife to one end and ensuring the other was solid enough to cave in the opponent's brain case without serious warping. Their military insisted that every soldier from the lowest food server to the highest general be given a formal education to stick. Even outside the military, civilians invented games that recreated a time where Stick still dominated the battlefield. The humans even preserved tombs written by their finest stick swingers in long dead dialects. They would painstakingly preserve, translate, and even train in these ancient texts. In this way, they kept the spirit of Stick alive, even though it had long since passed into obsolescence on the battlefield. The other species we call the mantids. We do not know what they call themselves, as they only interact with other species through violence. The humans had the honor of naming the mantids after one of the homeworld's microfauna. We are certain other races encountered mantids first, but the humans were the first ones to survive the encounter and bring back a specimen. The mantids were a collection of bioforms of all sizes and shapes. They were not of our galaxy. Many scholars theorized that they were forced to cross the vast gulf of space between galaxies after they had consumed all the resources of the galaxy that spawned them. Despite their many forms, the mantid were easy to identify by their titanium-infused scythe arms, their robust physiology, and worst of all, adhere to unknown technology which could cause high-intensity energy weapons and ballistic projectiles to impact miles from their intended target. Long ago, the Mantis discovered Hyde's ultimate rebuke of rock. The appearance of the Mantids in our galaxy was a shock to all star-faring peoples. Empires that had outlasted the death of their cradle world star were wiped out in a matter of months. On the ground, mantid soldiers were invulnerable to everything that didn't also destroy a biosphere. In space, mantid ships could only be destroyed through a massed firepower of a sector fleet. Inevitably, some mantids would find a way to make planetfall and claim another world. Every race poured their scientific expertise into studying the few captured examples for mantid technology. The combined wisdom of the galaxy toiled day and night, trying to make a rock that would make it through the mantid's hide. The humans, on the other hand, took a different approach. Civilian and military personnel who had kept the lessons of Stick alive through the long years in exile were brought in to train a new army. Weapons and armor based on museum relics were forged with the best modern alloys. 
the teaching of George Hale, Ayamuta Masashi, Jokim Meya, Guan Yu, and Akili Moroza were made top priority for infantry training. Officers frantically reread the campaigns of Alexander, Hannibal, and Julius Caesar, trying to prepare for this new, old style war. The humans knew it would be their time soon. Vast refugee fleets passed through human control territory. The refugees brought footage and first person accounts of the mantid style of war. The humans actively sought out this information and modified their training and strategies accordingly. By the time the man had arrived in human space, one visionary general had a plan. On a sparsely populated world on Fenris, three new style regiments, 5,000 soldiers in total, would be deployed to contest the Mantid at once. Journalists of all species were invited to Fenris with the promise that if things went bad, they would be given preferential space on evacuation shuttles. A few were even crazy enough to accept. These humans wanted the galaxy to know that if they were to die, they would die well. The clash took place on the rolling foothills of the tallest mountain range on the planet. Mantid drop pods made planet fall on the valley below. A great swarm of mantid bioforms emerged and started the usual eradication sweep of the planet. The human army had fortified several hilltops with the best static defenses, time, and resources could allow. These forts were arranged in a cone with a wide end towards the mantid advance. Initially, only the frontmost forts were fully manned. A skeleton crew held down the rear, vigilant for unexpected breakthroughs. The order of battle at each hill fort was decidedly Roman in origin. The bulk of human forces were drawn up into two main lines. Each line was three soldiers deep, stretched across the prearranged choke points. Halberdiers were evenly distributed throughout the line shieldmen. Loose skirmishing squads were scattered between the two lines. The logic was that the line fighters would focus on what was in front of them, while the skirmishing squads would plug the gaps and exploit openings. Instead of allowing the mantids to find them over the course of their eradication sweep, the humans began beating on gigantic drums. Boom, boom, clack. Boom, boom, clack. And out. Over the top of this, they played a recording of their greatest songsmith, Reddy Mercury. His now famous words of defiance echoed down the floodplain. Buddy, you're a boy. Make a big noise. Playing in the streets gonna be a man someday. By the time the song reached its chorus, every human and many alien voices sung in unison, We will, we will rock you. We will, we will rock you. Each soldier made their own contribution to the rhythm by pounding their weapon halves on the ground or slapping their shields with the pommel of their swords. Yet for all the human bravado, the mandids were not intimidated. They charged in a great wave of chitinous horror. The humans responded by bracing the base of their shields in the ground and readying their weapons for the gruesome work ahead. This first impact has caused many of the observers to flinch or fleeing in terror. Yet, the human line held. Relief teams rushed to and fro, plugging gaps and dragging the wounded to safety. What followed was 15 minutes of desperate hacking and stabbing, as the humans and the mantid warriors tested their opponents' limits. The mantids eventually fell back, leaving their dead and wounded behind. The stress of the melee combat was too much even for their enhanced biology. The humans took advantage of the break in the fighting to swap their first and second lines. A fresh line of swords, shields, and halberds faced down the mantid swarm and made the humans' intent known. This is our world, and we are here to stay. Again, the mantids charged, and again they were repulsed. The humans were tiring, and with each clash more mantid bioforms would abandon their eradication sweep and aid their brethren. The officers in charge called for the tririe to set up, and sent the rest of his men to waiting trucks. The tririe were specialist volunteers, usually comprised a large older men who had excelled in the study of a particular sword. 
While not as fit as the young men who made up the first and second lines, they knew how to make their presence felt. The triary were to be the rear guard, selling their lives so that the younger fighters could retreat in good order. As the mantis swarmed over the abandoned defense hill, they met pockets of triary who lashed out with great swords. There were not enough of them to form a tight formation, but their duty was to stall, not repulse. No one would witness the last stand of the triary, but their actions ensured the fighters of the first and second line could recover as they made their way to reinforce another hilltop fortification. Each time they fell back, the humans occupied a smaller front with fewer hills to defend. In this way, multiple understrength companies could be combined to create an effective defense. The fortifications on each hill had their own contingent or triary. They would welcome the battered main force with food and drink, guided the deployment with special attention to the unique terrain of each fort, do what they could to keep the line from collapsing. Then, when the retreat order was given, they would take up their great swords and throw themselves into the mantid horde. On hill after hill, these triary gave their lives for the men and women that had only known for a few hours. This process was repeated through five layers of defense. The human army folded in on itself as it took a bloody toll in the mantid biforms for every meter leading up to the final redoubt. This place was chosen for the last stand due to a large field that they could safely land three evacuation shuttles at a time. Beyond the field rose the treacherous scree slopes. Any advantage the humans could have gained by moving to higher ground would have been negated by the treacherous footing. By the time the last hill fort was abandoned, every mantid on the planet had coalesced into a single assault group. Their earlier battles had taken a toll on the mantid swarm. Those who were not killed outright sported cracks and punctures in their exoskeleton. Some were even missing limbs and slowed down the advance with the lopsided gait. The humans, true to the word, offered a place on the evacuation shuttles to the Xeno journalists who had come to witness the battle. The journalists would be packed in with the wounded, but at least they could return to their people and give testimony to what had happened. Many chose to stay, instead giving their seat to a wounded human. They reasoned every one of these soldiers was a hero, and the future would need heroes more than chroniclers. With a data feeds connected to archive ships in orbit, the remaining journalists resolved to witness the human's last stand before meeting a similar fate. The general and architect of the past ten hours of mayhem emerged from his command tent dressed in ornate battle armor. A recurring snarling wolf pattern was inlaid with gold onto the functional steel plates of his armor. He gave one final order to an aide, Unleash the riders! Then he took his place in the battle line. Every recording device was pointed his way as he issued one of the most famous speeches in galactic history. If I am to die today, I will die standing shoulder to shoulder with the finest warriors of the galaxy. Our foe has consumed over a thousand worlds, but they will not consume this world. Where they once found terror, they will find our resolve. When they once found fleeing civilians, they will find our battle line. When they once found an ineffective projectiles, they will find our cold, hard steel. With that, he lifted his sword skyward in a gesture of defiance to a doom so many had seen as a foregone conclusion. Every human still breathing copied his gesture and let out a cheer. The remaining journalists forgot their role as observers and joined in. Human and alien alike then turned towards the mantid advance, knowing that the next few hours would decide who owned this planet, and ultimately, the galaxy. Moments later, the first mantids emerged from the tree line. Smaller bioforms had been wiped out in the earlier stages of the fighting. All that remained were the heavy, scarred monsters. And the humans were different too. Every man and woman on that line were hardened veterans, 
masters of their tools of war, and experts in dispatching mantid bioforms. Their lives of 400 triary and upwards of 1,200 regular infantry had bought them this opportunity. With both sides at near exhaustion, the humans abandoned their two-line strategy and made ready for one last clash. Once again the lines met, mantid limb sides crashed into shields, swords sought the gaps in the armor, a bird's hat and thrust. Individually, a single human was no match for all the monstrous fireforms that assaulted the final position. However, the last few hours of fighting had merged these individual soldiers into a single-minded engine of destruction. Feints and baits neutralized those deadly limb sides, while others would swarm the flanks of the larger bioforms, hacking and pouring at its limbs until one of their number could deliver a fatal blow. So many acts of heroism and sacrifice were committed in that final clash that many cultures, both human and Xeno, used the word Venrisian to describe the actions that surpass what could be reasonably asked of an individual. Over the din of the battle, a low growl could be heard. It was quiet at first, but was steadily increasing in volume. From monkers hidden some distance from the main fighting force, motorcycle cavalry burst force. Each rider sat upon a fearsome assault bike and carried both lance and hooked sword. They mantid, in an attempt to engulf the last humans, stubbornly holding their ground, had overextended their forces. It was into these dangerously thin flanks the assault bikes made their charge. For the first time in galactic history, mantid determination was found wanting. The surviving infantry let out a great cheer at the sight of the mantid horde in total retreat. The assault bikes harried them all the way back to their dropships. With no order to the route, the retreating mantid bioforms were easy meat for the motorcycle cavalry. The few mantids that managed to escape to space were met by Sector Fleet who finished the job the human infantry started on the hills of Fenris. News of the miracle at Fenris quickly spread throughout the galaxy. Propaganda media was created in every language for every species. The warriors of Fenris, as they became known, were sent to every major wolf and fleet in the non-mantid sectors of the galaxy. There they taught, inspired, and often led both human and xeno armies against the mantid threat. The vast collection of mantid technology harvested from the hills of Fenris was studied and a weakness was found. The ancient waltz of stick, rock, and hide continued. As for the human general whose cunning and leadership resulted in the first mantid defeat, his remains were found in the maw of the largest mantid bioform ever recorded. In hands was clenched the ornate sword which was driven through the soft roof of the mantid's mouth and into the brain case. No statue now stands where he fell. He is posed with his sword held high as he did at the end of the last speech. Gold inlays faithfully reproduce the armor he wore in life. Surrounding him are onyx walls with the name of every soldier who took part in the miracle at Venris. The names of the Xeno journalists who were present that day also appear on those walls. At each hill the humans contested a stone pillar was erected in the names of those who died there. The base of the pillar was reserved for the names of the triary. It was deemed appropriate that in death as in life they would be the ones who would carry the greatest burden. The largest pillar is the one at the final redoubt which records the name of those who fell in the last clash. The general statue stands at its top. After the war, Fenris became a popular pilgrimage site for all species. It was customary for beings from across the galaxy to stand in contemplation, offer prayers, burn incense, or pour one out at the foot of each pillar. The warriors of Fenris who went out into the larger galaxy have their own monuments. They were instrumental in pushing back the mantids out of the galaxy and reclaiming the lost worlds. On every reclaimed world, and many that just gave soldiers, there was some public monument of a human holding a stick. End of story.
And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.